Hello everyone, welcome back to our MOOC on Zero Knowledge Proofs. I'm Yu Peng Zhang, and today I'm going to talk about polynomial commitment schemes based on error occurring codes. Recall that a common paradigm to co construct efficient snarks for general circuits is to combine a polynomial commitment scheme with an appropriate polynomial interactive oracle proof, such as the Planck ILP and the interactive proofs as we've seen in previous lectures. Last time, I started the section on polynomial commitments and talked about the classical protocol of the KCG polynomial commitment. The protocol utilizes the bilinear pairing and has this trusted setup step to compute the global parameters with this structure and the trapdoor in it. And the key idea of the scheme relies on this polynomial equation to compute the quotient polynomial Q of X. And the scheme has a very small proof size and a very fast verifier time in practice. The proof only consists of a single element uh, in the group, and the verifier only needs to compute a single pairing equation. In addition, I also talked about other polynomial commitment schemes without trusted setup that are based on discrete log problem. Those include bullet proofs, Hyrux, Dory, and Dark. In this lecture, we are going to see a new class of uh, polynomial commitment schemes based on error current codes. And to give you some motivations, here I'm uh, showing you the pros and cons of uh, these schemes on this slide. So on the positive side, we are not aware of any uh, efficient uh, algorithm on quantum computers to break the assumptions of these schemes. So the schemes are plausibly post-quantum, unlike those that are based on discrete log problem. In addition, the poorer time of these schemes tend to be fast because they do not require any group exponentiations. The poor only computes hash functions, Merkle trees, and some field additions, modifications, and FFT. Finally, the size of the global parameters is very small, and there's no trusted setup. All we need to do is to sample a hash from a family of hash functions, and the size is constant. But of course, these nice properties come at a cost. The first drawback is that these schemes uh, usually have a very large proof size. And as you will see later, we are talking about several megabytes to tens of megabytes in practice. And another drawback is that because of the lack of the algebraic structure, these proofs do not uh, uh, have this homomorphic property, and they are hard to aggregate uh, in a similar way as we've seen last time in the variance of KCG polynomial commitments to support multi-point evaluations. So to understand the schemes based on error current codes, here's the plan of this lecture. There will be three segments. In the first segment, I'm going to talk about some background on error current codes. And with that background, in the second segment, I'm going to present the polynomial commitment schemes using any error current codes. And in the last segment, I'm going to talk about this interesting line of work to build linear time encodable code based on expanded graphs. And the polynomial commit schemes and zero knowledge proof schemes using this type of code uh, can have a linear time prover in terms of the number of uh, field additions and field modifications. So let's start with the background. The error current code is actually a well-studied topic in the area of information theory and coding theory. It can be used to correct errors in the transmission over the network, and that is why it's called error current code. An error current code encodes a message of size k to a code word of size n, where n is strictly larger than k. An important property of uh, the error current code is this concept of a minimum distance. So the distance between two code words is the number of different locations between the two code words, and this is called Hamming distance. And if you take the minimum of the distance between any two code words and call it delta, that is the minimum distance of this error current code. And this uh, nk and delta are three important parameters of uh, the code, and we really call it nk delta code. And note that there's uh, another important uh, parameter is the alphabet of the code, whether it's defined over a binary or a finite field, but I'm omitting this parameter uh, in this uh, notation. So to give you uh, an example, the simplest example uh, I'm usually using is this repetition code. 
And here I'm using example with the message of size 2 over the binary values and the code word size 6. So essentially we are repeating each symbol three times to encode the message. So that's why we have the encoding of a 00, 0 gives you all zeros and encoding of 0, 01 is 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1. And similarly you have the encoding of 10 and encoding of 11. 1, 1. And that's all possible messages of a uh, length 2 over the binary heap. So then it's not hard to see that the minimum distance of this code is actually 3. Because if you take any two code words uh, from these four possible uh, code words, we have at least three locations between any two code words that are different. And because of this nice property, we can actually correct one error during the transmission. Suppose that because of the noise level, it can only introduce at most one uh, error during the transmission, and the code word we receive is this is what zero one zero one one one. Then, because of this distant property of the repetition code, there is only one message whose code word is one error away from this code word. That is zero one, and the code word is zero 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 one one one. And that is why we are sure that the original message must be zero one, even with such an error during the transmission. So that is the uh, original application of the error creating code. And the process to uh, derive this original message from a received code word is called the decoding algorithm. And an interesting thing to note here is that in our panomic commitment scheme, we are not going to use this deco decoding algorithm at all. So because of that, we can actually use error creating codes without efficient decoding. So next, I'm just going to uh, define some additional terms. So we have this uh, rate of an arrogant code as k over n. So essentially, it's representing the ratio of a meaningful message uh, when we have a code word of size k, uh, size n. Sorry. So so uh, this is basically measuring out of uh, n symbols, we only have uh, k symbols representing the message, and this is number between zero and one. And apparently, we want it to be as cl close to 1 as possible. And we also have uh, this term called relative distance. It's basically the minimum distance delta divided by n. So this is the ratio of a code word that is uh, different between any two code words. And again, it's a number between 0 and 1. And for the purpose of error correction, we also want it to be as big as possible. And using the same example of a repetition code, if we have a rate of 1 over a, meaning that we are going to repeat each symbol a times, then from the previous example, we can see that the distance of this code is a. And therefore, the relative distance is the delta over n, where n equals to k times a, so the distance is 1 over k. And turns out this is actually not very good, because it decays as the mesh size k increases. So it's not an asymptotic good code. And as we said, we want both the rate and the relative distance to be as big as possible. But unfortunately, there is usually a trade-off between the rate and the distance of a code. Intuitively speaking, increasing the rate will actually decrease the relative distance of the code. And we have well-studied bounds uh, on the relationship between the rate and the relative distance of a uh, code uh, under different settings. So the last concept I'm going to introduce is uh, this linear code. And the linear code is actually the most common type of code we are using in practice. So for linear code, we have an additional requirement that any linear combination of, two, uh, of code words is also a code word. And because of this property, it's equivalent to say that the encoding algorithm can always be represented as a vector matrix uh, modification between message m and a generator matrix of size k times n. And because of all these uh, cool techniques in linear algebra, the uh, linear code can be analyzed uh, to have uh, nice properties, and that's why it is uh, the most uh, common type of code we use in practice. And another implication of the linear code is that the minimum distance is the same as the number of the least number of non-zeros for any non-zero code words, and we call this as the weight of the code word. And this is actually not hard to see because the distance is defined as the 
timing distance between any two code words. And because the code is linear, the subtraction of those two code words is also a code word. So that is saying that the number of different locations directly implies another code word with that many non-zero elements. So therefore, the minimum distance between any two code words is just equivalent to the minimum weight of a non-zero code word for a linear code. So that's something uh, to keep in mind. So finally, I'm going to show you this uh, classic construction of the linear code called Reed-Solomon code. And this is actually a very important construction in the literature and has uh, many applications in, uh, to build cryptographic primitives, such as the zero-knowledge proof schemes of Lihero and uh, Stark, and also for secret sharing and other applications in cryptography. So here I'm defining a resum code over a finite field, modulo prime number p. And the encode uh, algorithm takes a, a size k message and encode it as a, a size n a code word. So the way to do it is we're going to view the message as a unique degree k minus 1 univariate polynomial. You can think of it as a polynomial interpolation uh, on a fixed set of uh, public points of size uh, k. And we are going to treat each symbol of the message as the evaluation at a, a predefined point, and then we're going to interpolate it and get a unique degree k minus 1 polynomial. Then the code word is simply the evaluation of this uh, polynomial at n points. Again, these are predefined and public points. For example, we can use the root of unity. Uh, we are going to evaluate at omega, omega to the 2, all the way to omega to the n, where omega to the n equals to 1 modulo p. And this is actually a linear code because the encoding algorithm can be represented as a vector matrix modification between the message and the generator matrix, which is, can be derived from the Fourier matrix. And the real sum code has a very uh, nice distance. The distance is actually n minus k plus 1. And this is very good. And that is because, as we said in the previous slide, for a linear code, the distance, minimum distance, is simply the minimum number of a non-zero elements of a non-zero code word. Then, as each code word is actually the evaluation of a k degree k minus one univariate polynomial, how many locations can be zero? Well, at most k minus one. That is because a degree k minus one polynomial has at most k minus one roots. So therefore, at least n minus k plus one locations are non-zero for a non-zero message. So that is why the distance is this one. And to give a concrete number, let's say that n equals to 2k. We are expanding the message uh, by 2 and get the code where n equals to 2k. Then the rate is a constant, 1 over 2. That's actually pretty good in practice. Then by this derivation, the relative distance is also 1 over 2. It's a constant. So the distance is also very good in practice. So it turns out this is actually the best you can achieve. And thus, the resolvement code is asymptotically good. And finally, the encoding time of resum code is order of n times log n using the fast Fourier transform algorithm, FFT, to evaluate this polynomial at these uh, endpoints defined by the roots of unity. So that's everything I want to talk about for uh, error recurring codes. With this background, in the second segment of lecture, I'm going to show you how to build polynomial commitments using linear codes. Recall that this is the setting of a polynomial commitment. We have uh, four algorithms, the key generation, commit, evolve, and verify. And the scheme I'm going to show you here is derived from the papers of Lihero, Budo et al. in 2017, Breakdown, and Orion. And the, the scheme has a square root size proof and a square root verification cost. So the key idea of uh, this polynomial commitment scheme is to identify the matrix structure uh, in the polynomial evaluation. So here I'm showing you that uh, a matrix consisting of the coefficients of the polynomial from uh, f11 all the way to f square root d square root d. And uh, I'm assuming that the number of uh, coefficients of a polynomial is uh, an exact power of uh, an integer. But of course you can pad it if it is not. And the reason why we are arranging the coefficients of polynomial in this form is that we can actually write 
the equation of a polynomial evaluation as uh, this equation. So we're going to have uh, two indices uh, i and j ranging from 1 all the way to square root d, and then uh, compute this uh, product between the coefficients and the corresponding uh, monomial uh, evaluated at point u in this way. And the nice property of uh, this way of computing is that the polynomial evaluation f of u can actually be decomposed into two steps. So in the first step, we are going to multiply a vector defined by this evaluation point u of size square root d with the matrix of the coefficients of the polynomial. And the result of this uh, vector matrix allocation will give you a vector of size square root d. Then in the second step, we are going to multiply that vector with this uh, uh, another vector derived from the evaluation point u and take the inner product. The result will be a single value that equals to the evaluation f of u. And if you do the uh, derivation following the rules of vector matrix uh, modifications, you can see that this computation is exactly the same as the equation at the bottom. So uh, I'm saying here that evaluation can be viewed as this uh, two steps of vector matrix modification. With this observation, we can actually reduce the polynomial commitment scheme uh, to uh, an argument for vector matrix product. So if you're uh, good with a, a scheme with a square root uh, d proof size, then we can actually just prove the computation of the first step. So in the first step, we are going to multiply this uh, vector of square root uh, d size defined by the version point u with this uh, matrix defined by the coefficients of the point on. And, and the result of that is a vector of a square root d size. So then the prover can just send this result of the vector directly to the verifier. And the verifier verifies that the first step is actually computed correctly using this uh, proof system, and then evaluate the second step locally by, mod, uh, by taking the inner product of uh, this vector with the, the second vector defined by the version point u. And in this way, the proof size is only this vector of size square d, and the verifier time is again square d uh, by computing that inner product. So this is saying that if we can have an argument scheme for this first step of vector matrix product with a reasonable proof size and verifier time, of course, then we are going to have a polynomial commitment scheme with a square d proof size and square d verification time. So in this way, we reduce the problem to this a simpler problem of vector matrix product. So then the focus uh, of the remaining part will be how can we design a scheme to test the computation of uh, this vector matrix product without sending this matrix directly to the verifier site. So the idea is to use the linear uh, error recurring code to encode this matrix defined by the coefficients of the polynomial. So here, we are going to encode each row of this matrix using a linear code. So then the uh, dimension of this uh, original matrix is square root d by square root d. And here, the size of the message of this linear code k equals to square root d. After encoding, we end up with an encoded matrix. And the dimension is square root d by n, where n is the size of the code word. And for your information, we are going to eventually use uh, linear codes with a constant rate. So then n is asymptotically the same as k, and which is also the same, asymptotically the same as the square root d. So after encoding, we're not increasing the size of this encoding matrix asymptotically. So with this encoding matrix, we are going to commit to this uh, uh, polynomial defined by this encoding matrix. And the commitment is using the Merkle hash tree. So recall that in previous lectures, we explained this uh, very important uh, primitive in a cryptography called Merkle hash tree. And the construction is to compute the hash of uh, two consecutive uh, uh, leaves and then do it recursively in a tree structure to get the root of this tree. And this root is served as a commitment of this vector. And later, the prover can actually open this uh, commitment and prove to the verifier that uh, the leaf at a certain location equals to uh, a particular value. And the proof is generated by traversing this tree and returning all the siblings along the path 
from a leaf to the root. And the verifier can actually uh, reconstruct the root with only the information from siblings, and the proof size is only logarithm in the size of the vector. So this is the Merkle tree. And the way to commit to this uh, polynomial is first we are going to encode this polynomial row-wise using the linear code. After that, we are going to use the Merkle tree to commit to this encoded matrix column-wise. We are going to view each column as one leaf of the Merkle tree, and then build this uh, Merkle tree on top of this uh, 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 matrix, and then send this uh, hash, root hash, to the verifier as the commitment of the polynomial. And using this commitment, you can imagine later that we can actually open uh, each column individually. The prover can actually send a column chosen by the verifier and then uh, together with the Merkle tree proof, and the verifier can verify that the column is uh, not altered. It's actually indeed as committed in the first place by the proof. So this is the commitment step of the uh, polynomial commitment I'm describing. And because of this uh, commitment step, then actually the key generation of this polynomial commitment scheme is very straightforward. All we need to do is to sample a hash function that will be used for the Merkle tree, and that's it. So there's no trusted setup, and the size of the global parameter global parameter is only constant. So then the most complicated uh, uh, protocol of this polynomial commitment scheme is this evaluation together with the verification. And uh, I'm going to spend uh, plenty of time explaining these steps in details. So the evolved algor algorithm can be roughly divided into two steps. And the first step is called the proximity test or proximity checking. And the main goal of this step is to test if the committed matrix indeed consists of these square root code words encoded row-wise. And the reason for this check is that, recall in the commitment phase, uh, an honest prover should commit to this matrix encode, uh, as uh, encoded from the original matrix defined by the coefficients of the polynomial. But if the prover is malicious, he may not follow the algorithms we, are, uh, we were describing. In particular, it is actually not hard for the verifier to check the size of this uh, matrix, for example, by returning one path of the Merkle tree. But even if the matrix is, the size of the matrix or the dimension of the matrix is as specified, each row may not be a valid code word of the linear code. A malicious proof could generate any arbitrary uh, uh, vector of length uh, n, and then put square root d of uh, these uh, vectors and commit it using Merkle tree and send it to the verifier. They're not even code words of this code. And again, using the resumption code as an example, if the proof is honest, then each row should be a resumption code encoding. In particular, a polynomial evaluated at n points. But a malicious prover may just commit to any vectors of uh, length n, and they may not be on the same polynomial of a degree uh, k minus 1. So that is the purpose of this first proximity test, trying to ensure that the committed uh, matrix is indeed encoded as specified by the commitment algorithm. And the way to do it is as follows. So first, the verifier is going to send a random vector of size square root d. And I'm using r1, r2, all the way to rd to denote it here. And the verifier is asking the prover to return the, the result of this vector times the encoded matrix. So then the result of this uh, computation is a vector of size n, the same as uh, the size of one row, if the prover is uh, honest. After that, the verifier is going to pick several random columns and ask the prover to open these columns. And recall that in the commitment phase, the prover already commits to the columns using a Merkle tree. So in this step, the prover also sends the corresponding Merkle tree proofs, in particular path uh, from the leaves to the root, so that by checking these Merkle tree proofs, the verifier can make sure that these random uh, uh, selected columns are indeed consistent with those committed in the first place. The prover cannot change the values of these uh, columns at all. Then, finally, the verifier is going to perform the following three checks. The first check is that this 
vector returned by the in the first round is indeed a code word of the linear code. And this is true if the proof is honest because of the property of a linear code. Any linear combination of code words still gives you a code word. So this is actually a linear combination of R1 times the of first row and R plus R2 times the second row and so forth. And this is uh, still should give you a code word if the proof is honest. Second, the verifier checks that the columns are indeed as committed using the Merkle tree. And this is, as I explained before, uh, can be done by checking the Merkle path, path proof to ensure that the prover cannot change any value of these uh, committed columns. Finally, the verifier is going to compute the inner product between this random vector and each column. And by the rule of a vector matrix allocation, you can see that if the answer is honestly computed, then the inner product between this vector r and each column should equal to the corresponding element of uh, this vector returned by the prover. And the verifier is checking this relationship for each column that is uh, chosen randomly by the verifier itself. And if all of these three uh, checks pass, then with the overwhelming probability, the verifier can actually conclude that the committed matrix is indeed uh, as encoded uh, in the uh, commitment algorithm we described before. So that is the description of this uh, proximity test. So then why is this uh, a protocol secure? So here I'm going to uh, sketch the intuition of the soundness proof. And uh, it heavily relies on the property of the linear code. So uh, as you will, we are going to start with a contradiction. Suppose that the prover cheats. So this committed uh, matrix is actually not an encoded uh, a matrix as specified. The prover can actually pick any values in the vectors and then put them together and commit it using a Merkle tree. Then uh, we are going to condition on whether this vector in the first round is correctly computed or not. So if this vector is correctly computed based on this uh, uh, like a fake matrix chosen by the prover, then by the property of a linear code, it can, uh, the, the uh, vector matrix product as a correctly computed by the prover cannot be a code word. So then the check one will fail. So this is saying that this is a simple uh, 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 strategy. So the prover is cheating, it's committing to a wrong matrix, then you, you just can't follow the wrong matrix and compute the inner product between this uh, random value vector and the matrix. And the result won't be a code word because of the linear property of the, the code and won't pass check one. Which means that the adversary is left with only the second option, which is the prover has to return a wrong vector that is not the result of the inner, uh, the product between this vector and this uh, 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 matrix committed by the prover. And if that is the case, then uh, we have this nice property of the distance of the code word. Because this wrong answer still has to be a code word to pass check one, then by the minimum distance property of a linear code, there should be many locations that are different from the correct answer. For example, if you're using a resolving code again with a distance one, a relative distance one half, then that means that half of the locations are actually wrong, actually different from the correct answer of this uh, uh, vector matrix product. Because of that, by the second check, the columns are the same as committed. You cannot lie about these uh, uh, columns that are opened by the verifier. Then it means that the probability of uh, passing the third check is extremely small. That is because if half of the locations are actually different from the correct answer, what is the probability of opening a random column and still passing the verification of this inner product? The inner product uh, between this random vector and this column is actually correctly computed given the fact that half of locations are actually wrong. Well, the probability is uh, one half, it's a constant. So then by opening multiple columns, saying that 100 columns, the probability of passing this check three 
decays exponentially. So in that way, we can actually achieve a, a negligible soundness error, and uh, so that the whole soundness can actually uh, be uh, proven to have a negligible cheating probability. So that is the intuition behind this uh, uh, proximity test. Okay. So this proximity test algorithm was actually introduced independently by these two papers. The first one is Lihero, and the second one is by uh, Bulo et al. in 2017. And uh, in Lihero, they called uh, this one as an interleaved test, and the protocol uses the resolvement code with an encoding time of quasi-linear, uh, order of uh, log n. And uh, independently in Budo et al. in 2017, uh, they also proposed a similar uh, proximity test algorithm, and they call it the ideal linear commitment model. And based on this model, they actually designed a scheme for a general purpose SNARK for a circuit computation. And they were using a linear time encodable uh, code instead of resummon code, which I'm going to introduce this in the third segment of the lecture. And this actually gives the first SNARK with a strictly linear pure time in terms of field additions and field modifications. And by the way, the schemes proposing these two papers were actually for general purpose SNARKs. And uh, here I'm actually presenting this technique and use it to construct the polynomial commitments uh, as a, a specialized protocol, which was actually proposed in the uh, uh, follow-up papers uh, such as uh, a breakdown in the Ryan that I'm going to highlight later. So um, that that is just the intuition of the soundness proof. And it turns out in the formal proof things are actually much more complicated. And uh, here I'm just showing you the, the kind of key differences and uh, I refer you to read the details in the paper of Lihero. So turns out in the formal proof uh, is actually we, we can't uh, prove that the prover cannot change a cheat at all. Like uh, we can't catch the pro uh, uh, a cheating prover if it merely changes like one value of this encoding matrix. What we can prove is that if the committed matrix C is very far away from any code word that is encoded as specified by commitment, we can actually catch it with an overwhelming probability. In particular, we define another parameter called E that is related to the distance of this linear code. So E is less than delta over 4, and then for, for any uh, number E. Then if the committed matrix is E far from any code word, meaning that uh, if we take the minimum distance of uh, any row with any code word in this linear code, and if that distance is actually E far away, meaning that at least E locations are different, then we can actually catch the prover, the cheating prover, with an overwhelming probability. Why is that? Well, in the formal proof, we can show that if this matrix C is E far from a real uh, code word, then the uh, vector matrix product between a random vector R and this encoded uh, and this committed matrix C. The result, we call it W, that is exactly the vector returned by the prover as I specified in the protocol. The probability of that, uh, the probability of that vector is e close to any code word is less than or, uh, or equal to e plus 1 over the size of this finite field. So this is extremely small, this is negligible. Which means that if the committed matrix C is e4 from any uh, code word as a matrix, then this vector is also e far from any code word with high probability. So that is the uh, difference of the claim from the intuition to the formal proof. So then if you rule out this possibility, then the remaining part is exactly the same as the intuition. Uh, conditioning on this, this uh, vector w is actually e close to uh, any, uh, e, sorry, e far from any code word, then the probability of passing check, check 3 for t random columns decays exponentially with t. So in particular, because uh, like e over n fraction of the values are different from the real uh, result, then the probability of passing all checks of or all t random columns is 1 minus e over n to the power of t. And that decays exponentially with t. And this is exactly the reason why we need a linear code with a constant relative distance. 
And so this E is related to the distance of the code. So you can roughly think of this as an odd, uh, is related to the relative distance. And if you have a constant relative distance, this number is a constant, and then we can make it negligible by repeating the check for t columns, say 100 columns or 500 columns. Otherwise, if the distance of the code is not good, then we cannot make this probability negligible. So that is why we need a linear code with constant relative distance, such as Riesama code. And by the way, in a recent version of this Lee Herald, the authors further show that we can actually choose any E that is less than delta over 3 as a parameter in this proof. So that improves the proof size uh, by some, uh, some factor. So that is the uh, uh, reason why this uh, proximity testing is uh, working. We can actually show that the committed matrix is actually close to a code word that is encoded using the commitment algorithm. Another interesting thing I want to mention here is that we can actually perform one optimization in this proximity test. So the optimization is that instead of sending the code word, which is the result of this uh, vector matrix product, the prover can actually send a message behind this code word to the verifier. And then the verifier can actually use this message, it can actually encode this message to recover this code word that was supposed to be sent by the prover, and then perform the remaining checks. And why this is a nice optimization? First, this actually reduces the size of the proof, because instead of sending a vector of size n, we now only need to send a, a, size, a, a message of size only m, uh, only k, that is uh, equal to uh, square root d. Another optimization is that the verifier now doesn't have to perform the first check, where this vector is a code word. This check is performed implicitly, because this is, it is literally encoded from a message sent by the prover, so it has to be a code word. And another interesting observation is that by the property of a linear code, this message of size square d is exactly the same as the result of the vector matrix product between this random vector with the original matrix that was defined by the coefficients of the polynomial instead of the encoded matrix. And it is actually not hard to check due to the property of the linear code. So this is a, a, a nice optimization to keep in mind for the remaining of the protocol. So now with uh, the first step of this proximity check, with the overwhelming probability, the verifier knows that this committed matrix must be close to an encoded matrix. Then the second step of this uh, polynomial commitment is called the consistency test or consistency check. The purpose of this step is to really test that the inner product, uh, the, the vector matrix product between this uh, vector defined by the evasion point and this original matrix equals to the claimed result, a vector of a size square root d. And it turns out the algorithm, the protocol of this step is almost the same as everything we did for the proximity test. So in order to do that, first, the prover is going to send the message m to the verifier, where the message should be equal to the vector matrix product between this vector defined by the inversion point and the original matrix defined by the coefficients of the polynomial of square root d by square root d before the encoding. And the result should be a vector of size square root d, and that is the message of a linear code. Then the verifier is going to encode this message to get a code word of uh, length uh, n here. And as I explained in the previous slide using this optimization, this vector of size n should be the result of this uh, vector defined by the version point u times this encoded matrix of size square root d by n here. And this is uh, exactly the same as the proximity test with the optimization I introduced. After that, the verifier is going to pick several random columns and ask the prover to return these columns back. And recall that in, co in the commitment phase, 
the prover commits to these columns using Merkle hat tree. So in this step, the prover further proves that these columns are actually has the corresponding Merkle tree path, so that the prover cannot change any value of these committed columns. And finally, the verifier is going to perform exactly the same three checks as the proximity test. So first, this vector is actually code word. Second, the columns are as committed in the Merkle tree. And third, the inner product between this vector defined by the version point u and each column is consistent with the corresponding location of this code word. And the reason why I'm uh, actually removing these first two checks is that we don't need to do them anymore. So the first check is embedded in this encoding because of the op optimization I mentioned. The prover only needs to send the message to the verifier, and the fact that the verifier encodes it to the code word already tells the fact that this vector is a code word. The second one, we also don't need to do it because the columns we're opening here are exactly the same as ones in the proximity test. The verifier doesn't have to pick new randomly chosen columns. We, we are going to use exactly those columns opened in the proximity test, and we don't need to verify the Merkle tree uh, passes anymore. So the only difference, the only additional step to perform is this third one. It's again an inner product, but this time is the inner product between this uh, vector u here defined by the evaluation point instead of a random vector chosen in the uh, proximity test. And we are going to do the inner product between this one in each column and see that it is consistent with this code word computed from the encoding of the message. And again, if this test, test is true, then we can conclude that this message m is the product between this vector defined by u and the original matrix defined by the coefficients of the polynomial before encoding. So that completes the description of the second step of the consistency check. So uh, to sketch the soundness of this step, uh, first, by the proximity test, we already know that this committed matrix C is very close to a code word. Then, uh, in order to prove knowledge soundness, the key idea is that although we actually don't know whether this matrix is indeed exactly the same as an encoded matrix, because it is close to a code word, then it is actually enough to actually build an efficient extractor to extract the a coefficient matrix defining a polynomial. And this extraction is using the Merkle tree commitment and also the efficient decoding algorithm to decode this in, uh, committed matrix C. Because it is close to a code word, then there is a unique uh, a coefficient matrix F so that we can actually track F such that the vector U times F equals to this message M returned by the prover. And that completes the first step of this vector matrix uh, product argument. And this is uh, with an overwhelming probability. So that is the intuition of the soundness of this second step. And uh, if you, you are interested in the formal proof, please feel free to refer to the papers uh, for more details. And I'm not going to uh, talk about the formal proof in this lecture. So to put everything together, this is the uh, kind of the uh, algorithm of this entire polynomial commitment. So in the key generation, we are just going to sample a hash function from a family of uh, hashes. And to commit to a matrix, we are going to encode the coefficient matrix of f row-wise with a linear code. And then we are going to compute the Merkle tree commitment on the columns of this uh, encoded matrix. And then the eval and the verify algorithm uh, are actually a kind of an interactive uh, process. So there are two steps, a proximity test and a consistency test. In the proximity test, we are going to compute the random linear combination of all the rows using the random uh, challenge by the verifier. And the verifier is going to check its consistency with t random columns. And this guarantees that the, in, uh, the, 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 the committed matrix is actually close to an encoded matrix. Then in the second step, we are going to perform this consistency check. And we are going to use exactly those columns opened in the first step and check there that the inner product between the vector u defined by the evaluation point u 
where this column is consistent with the answer that is encoded from the message app. So in this way, we can make sure that u times the, the coefficient matrix f equals to n. And to complete the polynomial evaluation, we can perform the second step locally on the verifier side. So the verifier simply computes the inner product between the message m and the second half of the vector defined by this evaluation point. And I'm just going to call it u prime for simplicity. And uh, if you still recall the uh, derivation we showed in the very beginning, there's two steps of the vector matrix product and the inner product gives you the evaluation f of u, if the prover is honest. So that completes the entire description of this polynomial commitment. And this also uh, shows you kind of the necessity of this proximity test and the consistency check. So one question I really get uh, when seeing this protocol is, it looks like the proximity test and consistency test are almost the same. We are using the same uh, open columns and we are checking the inner products between these columns and the corresponding vector. So can we just perform only the consistency test without the proximity test? But the answer is no. And intuitively speaking, the reason is because this U is not randomly generated. It's actually derived from the evaluation point U in a very well-structured way. And if this evaluation point is not from uh, randomly chosen from a large domain, randomly in a finite field, then with the consistent sets only, the prover can actually cheat if he knows some information ahead of time about the evaluation point you're going to choose. And that is why this proximity test is necessary. So no matter what will be the evaluation point, we are going to run this proximity test using random challenges from the verifier. And this guarantees that the committed matrix is actually close to an encoded matrix. And then we can perform the consistency test and uh, extract this uh, witness such that the vector matrix product is uh, equals to n with an overwhelming probability. So then uh, next, let's see the properties of this polynomial commitment scheme based on the linear code. So the key generation is very efficient. It does not require any trusted setup and it merely samples a hash function. So the size of the global parameter is constant. In the commitment, there are two steps. So first, we're going to encode this matrix row-wise. And the complexity is dominated by the encoding algorithm of the linear code. So if you're using the uh, resolvement code, for example, then the encoding uh, complexity is the order of d times log b. Uh, uh, we are talking about field additions and modifications. Alternatively, we can use any linear code with a, a good a dis relative distance, in particular constant relative distance. So then if you're using linear time encoded code with good distance, we can achieve a linear encoding time in this step. Next, we're going to commit this encoded matrix using a Merkle tree. And this one is actually not the dominating cost. We're going to compute the order of d hashes, and the commitment size is only constant, the root of the Merkle tree. The evaluation will take uh, order of d field additions and modifications again, and can be made non-interactive using the Fia-Shamir transformation. So then uh, Finally, the, the kind of, uh, as I mentioned, the drawback of this scheme is the proof size is relatively large. So in the scheme I'm presenting here, the proof size is the order of square root d. And that is because we are opening essentially one row and the multiple columns of this encoded matrix. And the uh, optimal solution is to set the matrix dimension as square root d times square root d. So the proof size is order of a square root d. And similarly, the verifier time is order of a square root d. So to show you some concrete numbers, so th this is the performance of the polynomial commitment scheme that was actually uh, described in the breakdown paper. So uh, for a polynomial of degree d equals to 2 to the uh, 25, that is uh, about 32 uh, million, uh, using a linear time encodable code, then I'm going to explain in the next segment, the commitment takes 36 seconds using a single thread on a, a reasonable machine. And the evaluation to generate the proof only takes 3.2 seconds. So these numbers are actually uh, excellent in practice and uh, are significantly faster than those schemes 
based uh, on discrete, discrete log and bilinear parity. For example, the KCG parameter scheme and the Boolean proofs, because it is not using any group exponentiations. It's linear number of additions and, and modifications. So that's, so that's very efficient. But apparently the drawback is the proof size. So using this uh, scheme with the square root proof size, we are talking about 49 megabytes concrete. So this is really a big uh, overhead and may not be desirable for certain applications. And finally, the verifier time is about 0.7 seconds. So that's actually a reasonably fast in practice. So uh, before I conclude this segment, I also want to uh, further discuss uh, several uh, follow-up papers uh, in the literature uh, that leads to this panoramic community scheme I'm describing. So actually, the key idea of this version of panoramic community scheme came from these two papers. So recall that uh, in the original paper of the Lihero and uh, the Spudo in 2017, they were merely describing a way to do this uh, uh, proximity test. And in order to make it uh, work for a panoramic commitment efficiently, it relies on this nice observation and, and the improvements of the protocol for tensor query IOP proposed by Budo, Kiasa, and Gross in 2020. So in this paper, they proposed uh, this uh, protocol that I was describing for tensor products and tensor query. And what is that? So to give an example for just two dimensions, that's exactly the protocol we were describing. So that works for the inner product between a vector f, and you can think of this as the coefficients of panamium, and another vector that is generated by the tensor product between two subvectors of size square root d. So u tensor u prime. And it only works for this type of uh, inner products, but not the general inner product for arbitrary uh, vectors. And, uh, and in this paper, it also generalized the protocol to multiple dimensions in, instead of just dimension two. And using this approach, we can actually achieve a smaller proof size that is order of n to the any small constant epsilon that is less than one. And you can think of the scheme as basically a generalization to a multi-dimensional matrix, and we are performing this uh, proximity test and consistency test recursively dimension by dimension. And uh, the, uh, the, the, the end result will gives you this uh, smaller proof size of order, order of uh, n to the epsilon instead of only square root n. Then uh, uh, with this uh, tensor IOP uh, paper, then the, in the breakdown paper, they actually introduced uh, this panoramic scheme that I was describing earlier in this lecture based on this tensor theory. So this is the uh, actually the origin of the uh, panoramic commitment. And another important contribution of this paper is actually proposes uh, another uh, technique to prove knowledge soundness. And that is actually worth mentioning. So recall that uh, an interesting uh, observation of the problem that I was describing is that it does not need the decoding algorithm of the linear code at all. The prover sends the message of this uh, vector matrix product to the verifier, and the verifier encodes it to get the code word. So there's no decoding algorithm involved. So because of that, we can actually use any code without an efficient decoding algorithm. And it gives a lot of uh, relaxation on the design space of the code. But unfortunately, in order to prove soundness formally, especially this uh, extractor for knowledge soundness, we need an efficient decoding algorithm to extract the witness of the uh, a coefficient matrix from this committed matrix that is close to a code word. If the decoding algorithm is not efficient, the extractor won't be of polynomial time, and it actually doesn't work. So this paper shows you an alternative way to prove knowledge soundness. And the approach is similar to a single protocol with the rewinding of a multiple random queries to extract this uh, coefficient matrix without efficient decoding. So with this uh, contribution, we can uh, finally use any linear code without efficient decoding to build such an efficient panoramic commitment scheme. And another two papers worth mentioning are this uh, Budo, Kiyos, and Liu in 2021, and then this uh, our Orion paper by Xie, Zhang, and Song in 2022. And the main contributions of uh, these two papers for this part is to improve the proof size. Recall that the proof size 
in the version I'm, I was describing is square root D, and it's actually concretely a very large, tens of uh, megabytes. So in this paper by uh, Budo et al. in 2021, they reduced the proof size to polylog n using a proof composition technique combining the tensor LP with the PCP of proximity proposed in this paper. And uh, the contribution of the Orion paper is actually uh, to reduce the proof size with a concrete efficient uh, uh, protocol. So the result is uh, it can actually improve the proof size to order of a log n square with a proof composition technique using the code switching technique proposed in this paper. And concrete speaking, it reduces the proof size for the degree d equals to 2 to 25 from this uh, about 50 megabytes to 5.7 megabytes. So this is about an order of magnitude improvement, but still it's actually quite large uh, in practice because of the distance of the code and also the design of this entire uh, polynomial commitment scheme. So because of that, this really gives you a trade-off between efficient poor time and uh, the large proof size, and you should choose appropriate schemes for your application. So that's the entire segment for the uh, polynomial commitment based on uh, the linear code. So in the next segment, I'm going to present a, a, a concrete construction of a linear time encodable code, which leads to a linear time for polynomial commitments and zero knowledge group schemes. Welcome back to the last segment of the lecture. So in this part, I'm going to talk about linear time encodable code with a constant relative distance uh, using expander graphs. And uh, uh, this code has been used in this interesting line for uh, work to construct SNARKs with a linear poor time. Here I'm talking about the linear number of uh, field additions and modifications, so they can be really efficient in practice. And uh, as I mentioned uh, earlier in this lecture, this line of work uh, was initiated by uh, Bhutto, Chiruli, uh, Gaddafi, Gross, Hajabadi, and Jacobson in 2017. And there they proposed this uh, ideal linear commitment model with a square root D proof size. And this is basically the proximity test I explained in the earlier part of the lecture. And later, this scheme uh, was uh, further improved by Bhutto, Kiyos, and Gross in 2020 uh, to construct an IOP that supports tensor queries. In this scheme, they can actually achieve a proof size of order d to the power of epsilon for any small constant of uh, epsilon. And uh, after that, in this paper by Bhutto, Kios, and Liu, they further improve the proof size to be polylog d using uh, proof composition between tensor LP and the PCB of proximity. After that, uh, in this uh, breakdown paper by Golovna, Li, Seti, Thaler, and Awabi, uh, they actually use this technique of tensor LP to build an efficient polynomial commitment with a proof size of order of uh, uh, d to the power of epsilon. And also, as mentioned in this paper, they showed how to prove knowledge soundness without efficient decoding of the linear code. And finally, uh, in our Orion paper by Xie, Zhang, and Song, uh, we further propose a code switching technique to reduce the proof size to order of a, a log d square using a proof composition and a code switching technique that is uh, concretely efficient. But uh, all of these papers are using this uh, single construction of the uh, linear time encoder code with a constant relative distance. So uh, in this uh, part, I'm going to uh, clearly explain to you that the construction and why it can actually achieve a constant relative distance. So this code uh, was actually proposed by Daniel Spielman in 1996 and uh, later it was generalized from a binary to a finite field uh, in this paper by Drew and Ishai in 2014. And uh, this code uh, relies on this uh, classical object called expander graphs. So uh, in an expander graph, uh, any subset of graph or subgraph can actually connect to uh, many neighbor of nodes in this graph. And so this is a very good expansion and called expander graph. And here I'm showing you an example of a bipartite graph, meaning that there is a left set of nodes and the right set of nodes. And there are connections between these two sets, but there is no connection within each set. And that is called a bipartite graph. And in this bipartite graph, every node on the left has uh, three outgoing edges connecting to, a node, to nodes on the right-hand side. 
So the degree of uh, each node on the left is 3. Then this graph can actually has a very good expansion because you can check that uh, every two nodes on the left-hand side connect to at least five nodes on the right-hand side. So that is a good expansion. And because in total there are three edges from each node, so from a set of two nodes on the left, there are at most six outgoing edges. So it can connect to at most six nodes on the right-hand side. And now it connects to at least five, so the expansion is pretty good. So this gives you an example of the bipartite uh, graph that is a good expander. And this is exactly the type of uh, expander graph we are going to use to build this linear time encodable code. So to give you a very kind of rough intuition why we need such an expander graph to achieve a good relative distance, um, very roughly speaking, with such an expander, we are just going to put a message on the left set of nodes. We are going to put each symbol of the message into each node on the left-hand side. And then the way to compute this encoding is for every node on the right, we are going to sum the values of the nodes from the left that's connected to this node. For example, to compute the first symbol of this encoding, we are going to sum up the values in the first node on the left and the second node on the left because of these two edges. And that's it. That's a very simple algorithm to encode it just through a summation of the values from the neighbors on the left. And uh, this is actually a linear code because this uh, way of encoding can be represented as a vector matrix product between the message and the adjacency matrix of this bipartite graph. So that is the generator of this way of uh, encoding. So that is why it is a linear code. And it's also the encoding of this simple version can be done very efficiently in linear time simply because we're just going to go through each node and compute the summation on the left-hand side. Because this uh, number of edges from each node is constant, so the running time of this entire encoding is merely a constant times the size of the message. So that's a linear encoding. And the intuition why we need an expander graph to achieve a constant relative distance is because recall that uh, from the very beginning I said that the distance of a linear code is equivalent to the minimum weight of any non-zero code word. So it just suffices to count the number of non-zero code words for uh, all the messages. And the reason why we need a good expansion is because even if the message has a very small number of non-zeros, for example, there's only a single element of the message is non-zero, it expands to many nodes on the right-hand side. In this case, at least three nodes on the right. So one non-zero leads to at least three non-zeros on the right, and two non-zero leads to five. So that is amplifying the number of non-zeros from the message to the code word in order to achieve a good distance of the code. So that's the intuition why we need an expander. But unfortunately, this uh, simple encoding does not work. It's actually far away from, uh, from uh, being a, a good code with constant relative distance. And, uh, it's, it's not hard to see this because, again, using the example, if the message contains only a single non-zero value, by the requirement of a constant relative distance, the code word has to have a constant portion of the values to be non-zero. And clearly this is not possible using this simple encoding because one non-zero can only connect to three nodes on the right-hand side, which leads to three non-zeros in the code word instead of a constant fraction. So this simple way of encoding uh, does not work uh, directly. So the next I'm just going to show you the formal way of uh, encoding, uh, building this linear time encodable code with the constant relative distance using expander graphs. And also we'll show you why this can actually achieve a constant relative distance. So in order to do that, the first thing I'm going to define is this concept lossless expander. It's basically a type of expander that has a very good expansion, almost a, a perfect expansion among all expander graphs. So in a lossless ex expander, just to define some notations, we're going to use the size of L to denote number of uh, nodes on the left side. And the size of the, uh, the set on the right is a constant frac uh, fraction of L, alpha times L for a constant alpha. In this example, alpha is actually larger than 1 because the right-hand side is, is larger than the left-hand side. But in the real expander we're going to use uh, in this linear code, alpha is actually a value that is between 0 and 1. 
So the size of the uh, right set is actually smaller than the size of the left set. And then the degree of the node in the left set is a constant g, and the 3 in this case. So then with this definition, what is the maximum possible expansion for a subset on the left? If you think about it, if you take any subset of nodes on the left, the number of total edges is, is exactly g times s. And every node has g edges and you have s nodes in total. So then at most you can connect to g times s nodes on the right hand side. That's a maximum possible expansion. So then we are just going to define this loss expander in this way. Right? So we want some, uh, this expander graph to achieve this maximum possible expansion. And I'm using this uh, capital gamma of s to denote neighbors of this uh, subset of nodes. And the size equals to g to the s. So that's the best expansion you can have. But then it uh, turns out there has to be another condition to make it happen. It can't be true for all subsets, simply because we don't have enough nodes on the right hand side. Right? In total, we have alpha times l nodes on the right. And if this g times s is larger than that num number, it can't happen. You don't have enough nodes. So in order to make it happen, we have to have a condition on the side of this subset, saying that for all subsets that is less than or equal to alpha times l divided by g, we want the expansion to be maximum. And you can see this is g times s is less than or equal to alpha l. That's exactly describing the condition I was saying. As long as you have enough nodes on the right-hand side, I want maximum expansion. So that is the idea of this loss expander. But then again, this is actually too good to be true. So that is uh, uh, actually very hard to find such uh, graphs. So in the real definition of the loss expander, uh, we are going to relax this uh, two definitions, two conditions a little bit, but still following kind of the idea I've described. So in the real definition, instead of saying that this expansion of this subset S is exactly the same as g times s, that's the best you can do, we are going to say that it's going to be larger than or equal to 1 minus beta times g of s, where beta is actually a small constant. And when beta approaches to 0, that is the maximum expansion you want. So beta is a parameter of this loss expander. It's a relaxation. And similarly for this condition, orange you wanted to hold for any subset s with size less than or equal to alpha times l divided by g, again that is too good, and we use another parameter delta, small delta, to replace alpha, saying that uh, for all subsets of uh, a size that is smaller than or equal to this amount, we have this almost perfect expansion. And again, this delta should approach to alpha, and it's again a top constant. So that is the a real definition of a loss ex expander. And uh, for time being, all you need to uh, remember is that it is a bipartite graph with a very good expansion. Any small subset expands to a large number of neighbors on the right. And the encoding is we put message on the left-hand side, and we're going to sum up the corresponding nodes with the edges on the right-hand side to get the result of the encoding. So that's the concept of a loss expand. With that, next I'm going to show you an overview of this real encoding algorithm. It's actually much more complicated than just applying this uh, loss expander. It's actually a recursive uh, encoding algorithm. So uh, how can we encode a message? So suppose the size of the message is k. The goal of this type of encoding is to get a code word of size 4 times k. So the rate is a 1 fourth, is a constant rate. In the first step, we are just going to copy the message directly to be the first part of the code word. And this is part is of size k. And this is actually a quite common approach uh, in, uh, in Aracrine code. And the code with the first part to be exactly the same as message is called the systematic code. Then in the second part, we are going to apply this loss expander on this message. And we are going to use a loss expander with these parameters such that alpha equals to one half. The size of the red side is only half of the size of the left set. And then we have this good expansion uh, uh, characterized by uh, uh, delta and beta. And the result of this uh, applying lo uh, loss, loss expander gives you uh, an encoding that is of size k over 2. We are going to compute the right-hand side of the nodes using the summation from neighbors of the left-hand side. So that is the 
a vector of size k over 2. Then a very kind of important step of this encoding is that we are going to assume that we already have a good encoding algorithm, a good linear code for a message of size k over 2. And it already has a very good uh, constant relative uh, distance. And we are going to use it to construct this encoding algorithm for a message of size k. And for time being, just assume that we have such an encoding algorithm. Then we are going to apply it to the result of this loss ex expander. And the rate is again the same, it's one fourth. So the result is 4 times k over 2, and that gives us a code word C1 of size 2 times k. And we are going to put it as a second part of this uh, encoding, the code word. And we are not done yet. Finally, we have another step. We are going to run this code word C1 through another lost expander graph with alpha equals to 1 half and with the these parameters and good expansions. And the result of that is half of the size of C1 because alpha equals 1 half, the size of the nodes on the right hand side is 1 half. So we end up with another part we denote it as a code word C2 of size k. And then the final code word is the concatenation of the message C1 and C2. And the size is k plus 2k plus k. In total, it is 4 times k. And that's how we do this encoding algorithm using the loss expander. And then you may wonder, how can we get this encoding algorithm for the message of size k over 2 with a good relative distance? Well, using this exactly the, the same encoding algorithm for message of size k over 2. And that is why it is a recursive encoding algorithm. And once you have this vector of k over 2, how do you do this encoding? Well, you put this k over 2 vector again here with all of these parameters uh, divided by, by 2. You will k over 2, copy it, and then do another loss expander and get a k over 4 and do the recursive encoding step by step. So that is the recursive part of this encoding algorithm. Another thing to highlight is that although we are using two loss expanders with both alpha equals to one half, there are actually two different expander graphs because the size sizes are different. This expander graph takes an input of size k on the left side and generates a vector of size k over 2 on the right side. And this loss expander graph takes input a vector of size 2k and computes a vector of, of size k. So because of that, in this recursive encoding algorithm, we are actually using a sequence of loss expander graphs with similar parameters. Alpha always equals 1 half, and we want the expansions of these loss expanders to be uh, pretty good with all these uh, beta and delta and, and g parameters. So that is the high-level overview of this recursive encoding algorithm using the loss expander. And to put it in a little bit more formal way, so here is basically a description of this recursive encoding as I described in the, in the previous slide in the, in, the, in the chart. So we have a message of size k, and we want to get a code word of size 4k such that the rate is constant 1 fourth. Then we assume that there is an encoding algorithm from k over 2 to 2k 2 already with a very good relative constant distance, a constant relative distance delta. And we also suppose that there is a sequence of expander graphs, and we're using uh, two graphs from this sequence uh, of size k and 2k on the left hand side with alpha equals to 1 half. Then the encoding algorithm can basically describe the uh, by these uh, four uh, four steps. We're going to pass this m through the lost expander graph to get m1 of size k over 2. Then we're going to encode this m1 to get c1 of size 2k using this encoding algorithm from k over 2 to 2k with a good relative distance. Then we are going to pass C1 through another loss expander to get C2 of size k. And finally, we're just going to concatenate them together to get a code word of size 4k. And to complete this recursion, we are going to repeat it for k over 2, k over 4, until the message becomes a constant size. That is talking about this, uh, uh, this step, assuming that how can we, uh, like explaining how can we go from this uh, encoding of a k over 2 to 2k, we just repeat this enco entire encoding algorithm for size k over 2, and then k over 4, until a constant size. So finally, how can we complete this recursive encoding? Once the size of this message becomes a constant, we can actually use any code with good uh, distance for this message. For example, the read code. 
And here, because the size of the message is constant, no matter what we do, it won't affect the asymptotic uh, behavior of this code. The encoding time remains constant. And so that is the a formal description of this recursive encoding. So next, I'm uh, going to show you why this uh, way of encoding can achieve a, red, a constant relative distance. And so the theorem is saying that uh, the distance of this code, uh, delta prime, equals the minimum of delta, which is actually the uh, relative distance of this uh, code we use in the middle from k over 2 to 2k, and another parameter, delta or 4g, that depends on the expander graph. And this proof is actually a little uh, technical, but uh, uh, the first time I've, I've seen this proof from the uh, Drukin Shai paper and also the Spielman uh, code paper, it was uh, really impressive. And I, I really want to show you the idea of this proof of the constant relative distance. So yeah, let's do that. So uh, recall that these parameters are actually related to this uh, loss ex expander. This delta is the constraint on the size of this uh, a subset of the nodes on the left hand side, and this uh, g is the degree of this the node on the fr from the left to the right is a constant g, and also we have this beta beta is depends on delta and g and is not used directly in the analysis. Just to remind you that these uh, parameters, and uh, recall that the code word is the concatenation of the message c1 and c2, where c1 is derived from the uh, expander graph of m to get m1 and encode it using another uh, good uh, code with a constant relative distance of delta. Okay. So um, here, the high-level idea of this proof is to actually uh, break it down to several cases. Okay. So again, recall that for any linear code, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the uh, distance between any two code words is equivalent to the weight of a code word. So we are just calculating the minimum weight of any non-zero code word to get this uh, uh, the minimum distance. So that's what we are trying to prove here. And the first case is actually uh, uh, the, 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 the extremely simple. Okay? So we are saying that if the weight of the message is large enough, then we are done. Then the weight of this uh, code word is, is, is good, and then uh, there's nothing to prove here because we are copying this message to the code word. And then if you're counting the number of non-zeros in this code word, we already have more than 4k times delta prime number of non-zeros. So the distance uh, or the, the relative weight of this, uh, this code word is already uh, 4k delta prime divided by 4k. So that is larger than delta prime already. So we're saying that, that for all messages with the actually large weights, then automatically we get uh, large weight code words. So that is uh, very simple. Then uh, the second case is if this weight of uh, m is less than or equal to this 4k times delta prime, what can we do? So here is where the expander graph, a loss expander, kicks in. So recall that the definition of the loss expander has a condition on the size of the subset nodes on the left hand side. And this is exactly the condition where this, this is actually satisfied. So it is uh, so if we can show that if the weight of m is less than 4k times delta prime, right, and if you substitute delta prime with this delta over 4g, you can see that it means that the weight, the number of non-zeros, is less than or equal to k times delta over g. That's the exact condition of this loss expander. Because of that, if you use this s to denote the set of non-zero nodes, then it has to expand to more than 1 minus beta times g times s nodes on the right-hand side. That is the definition of the loss expander. And once you have this good expansion on the right-hand side, then by a simple counting argument, we can show that at least one node in this neighbor have, have, have a unique neighbor in s, which means that this uh, result of this expander m1 must be non-zero. And why is that? There's a simple proof by contradiction. Uh, suppose that you have, uh, so all the nodes on the, in the neighbors have at least two uh, neighbors in this S, then the total number of edges will be 2 times 1 minus beta times g times S. But in total, you only have g times S many edges, because each 
node in S have a, a, it has this a G outgoing edges as a constant. So then you just simply don't have enough edges in this graph. So because of that, at least one node in this neighbor have a unique neighbor in S. And in fact, you can actually do a much better bound. Yeah. Actually, a lot of nodes should have unique neighbors in S because of this good expansion. And the sole reason why we are trying to make such an argument is that we are, want to show that this result of this loss expander, we call it M1, is non-zero. That's all we need. As long as this M1 is non-zero, we are applying this recursive encoding of another good code with a constant relative distance of delta. Then the weight of the C1 has to be larger than or equal to 2k times delta because of the distance property of this uh, second code we use it in the recursive encoding. Right? So all we need to prove is that M1 is non-zero. As long as M1 is non-zero, the weight of C1 is actually pretty big. So that is the a key idea of this uh, second step. Uh, then actually, uh, in order to finish this entire proof, we are just following this uh, same idea just and then and do it again. Okay? So then we can just condition on whether this weight of C1 is big enough or not. Right? So if this weight of C1 is already larger than 4k delta prime, which is exactly the same argument as the first step, then we are done. It's right? saying that the number of non-zeros in C1 is already big enough. So the weight of C, the code for C, is actually uh, larger than uh, delta prime, and we're good. Okay? And else, if the weight of this uh, C1 is actually less than or equal to 4k times delta prime, but still larger than 2k delta, then we can apply the argument of loss expander again. Right? The size of this uh, subset is bounded, so because of the condition of this loss expander, we are going to compute C2 using the second loss expander, and we can show that because of the unique neighbors, the weight of C2 has to be larger than or equal to 2k times delta prime because of this counting argument. We simply have that many uh, nodes with unique neighbors, and they have to be non-zero. And then summing it uh, up together with this weight of C1, so C1 has to be larger than, the weight of C1 has to be larger than 2k times delta, we end up with the total weight to be larger than or equal to 2k times delta prime. And that completes the proof for this uh, distance of this encoding. Okay. So, I mean, again, I, I, I was saying that this is a little bit technical, but the high level idea I want, I want to deliver is that we're just proving it case by case. Right? The first case is uh, if the message has enough weight, then we are good. If not, then the condition of loss expander will be satisfied. And then this message will expand to many nodes on the right hand side. Then, by a simple counting argument, a, a big portion of these nodes will have unique neighbors from the message M, and the unique neighbors implies non-zero elements, because you're, you're, you're just summing the, the, the value in this non-zero elements with nothing else, and the result has to be non-zero. And then we are just going to apply it again, and finally the completed proof to show that it has the constant relative distance. And uh, uh, so that is the uh, proof why it has actually a constant relative distance. So with that, uh, we can actually build this linear time encodable code using the expander graphs, and that completes the entire description of the encoding algorithm. And the last piece of the puzzle is how can we find such lossy ex expanders? Do they exist in practice? Well, it turns out we can actually construct the lost expanders explicitly in a deterministic way. And this was proposed in uh, this paper in 2002. Uh, but unfortunately, the concrete efficiency of this approach is actually not very good in practice because it has a large hidden constant in the construction. Namely, you have to do a, uh, find a constant size graph with a very good expansion property. And the only way to do it is to do a brute force search. And you'll lead to very uh, uh, a big uh, overhead in practice. Another approach is to actually sample a graph by a property graph randomly. And as you may know, random graphs tend to have a good expansions. So if you just do that uh, with some good probability, you can actually have these loss expanders. But, uh, but unfortunately, the probability is only 1 over a polynomial in it, uh, instead of a negligible. So we can't achieve negligible uh, failure probability through random sampling. And this is also not hard to show, because the 
actually the lower bound of this failure property has to be an inverse polynomial, simply because the size of the graph is a polynomial in n, and your total uh, sample space, the, 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 the random space, is a polynomial in n. And there is at least one graph that is not lost expander. So then the probability of failure has to be uh, bigger than 1 over the polygon. So this is a very simple argument. So and then that leads to some improvements of this uh, uh, linear time encodable code based on expander graphs in these two papers, uh, Breakdown and uh, Orion. So uh, in the Breakdown paper, uh, they proposed uh, an improved version of this uh, encoding using random summations instead of plain summations. So uh, I was describing the way to encode the message is to actually sum the neighbors on the right-hand side from the nodes on the left-hand side. So in this paper, instead of doing the plain sum, they're going to assign a random weight for each edge in the finite field, and then doing a weighted sum based on the weights on these edges. And this actually boosts the concrete dif uh, distance significantly, and they can actually show that uh, the distance is actually very good in practice, but has very high probability. And Another uh, improvement in the, the Orion paper is actually we further proposed a testing algorithm to reduce the failure probability of this uh, uh, sampling uh, run uh, 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 lost leaks expander. And this test, uh, testing algorithm is actually based on an interesting connection between the expansion of a graph and the maximum density of a graph. So using this algorithm, we can actually build a testing algorithm to see whether a random graph is a loss expander or not, and the failure probability is reduced from inverse polynomial to a negligible. And you can actually do a rejection sampling to really get a good loss expander with an overwhelming probability. So these are the uh, contributions to the linear time encodable code from these two papers. So yeah, that's uh, everything about this uh, linear time encodable code. So finally, to put uh, everything together. So in this lecture, I showed you how to build a polynomial commitment uh, using uh, a, a linear code. And combined with the polynomial IOPs, for example, the Planck IOP and the interactive proofs uh, we uh, discussed in uh, the earlier lectures, we end up with SNARKs based on error recurring codes. And they have uh, these uh, nice properties. So in terms of uh, the advantages, they only have a transparent setup. There's no trapdoor and trusted setup in the uh, in these schemes, and the size of the global parameters is only constant. We only need to sample a hash function from a family of uh, hashes, and the time to commit to the polynomial and uh, to generate the proof is actually extremely fast in practice. So it only requires a linear number of uh, field additions and modifications in the degree of the polynomial. And the schemes are also plausibly post-quantum secure. And another important uh, feature I want to highlight here is that they are field agnostic, meaning that the schemes don't use FFT or uh, bilinear pairings or uh, discrete log, so, which means that they can actually work on any field you want. So you can actually pick a native field of the computation you want to prove and then run these algorithms, uh, run these uh, uh, schemes directly on that field. So that's another a nice feature about these schemes. And on the drawback set side, uh, as I emphasized several times, the proof size tend to be uh, very big in practice. So in the plain version I described uh, in this lecture, the proof size is square root d uh, in the size of the polynomial. And concrete speaking can be all the way to tens of megabytes. And even with these improvements using proof composition, they can be reduced to a poly log d or log d square, but still in practice, there are uh, several megabytes because of distance of code and also the mechanism to construct these polynomial commitments using the code and Merkle trees. So because of this, really depends on your uh, uh, applications and is a trade-off between the poor time and assumptions and this uh, 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 proof size. So that's the end of this lecture. And in the next lecture, we are going to uh, further discuss the Fry protocol and the Stark construction. Thank you for listening.